Hi, welcome back to yet another video. Um, I'm going to start with the teacher picture, but I have a couple comments I got to make on it. First, okay, think of this guy. He looks enthusiastic and everything. That's good. But I, two things came to my mind when I saw this. One, what's with all the books? How are people supposed to see what you're writing on the board if you have all these books stacked up? And why are they there? Have you forgotten everything about chemistry and have to look it up as you're teaching? I have no idea. And the second, what on earth is all this crazy lab equipment? Are students supposed to copy this diagram down? What are you trying to do with this? So when I saw the crazy lab equipment, two things came to my mind. There's an old cartoon called Dexter's Lab. He kind of has that sort of equipment. And then I thought of this. There was a I think last year, a 64-year-old retiree in a retirement community, and he had set up his own lab to do a to make crystal meth. And, you know, he's got his reflux over here and, and everything else like that. And, you know, I'll tell you what I told my son. He just graduated with a master's degree. And when he and his little friends were uh, in middle school, they asked, you know, could you, you're an organic chemist. Could you make crystal meth? And I was like, yeah, I could, but I'm not. So there you go. Here's what a real lab looks like <laughs> nowadays. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what he's trying to do with that picture. Anyway, uh, oxidation numbers and chemical formulas. So you will need the following. Uh, go ahead and, and get out your handy dandy blank periodic table because we're going to write some things on it. Let me kind of stretch that a little bit and make sure you have your regular periodic table. And I will pause until you get those things. Hey, I waited for you. You're back. All right, let's see what we got. First of all, what's an oxidation number and why do we care? Glad you asked. Glad you asked. Free update. Hey, it's a free update. I should do it. All right, here's what we got in the slideshow. All right, when two atoms come together to form a compound, we know that uh, they each have a positive nucleus. They each have negative electrons. So according to Coulomb's law, they're going to be attracted to each other. And the nature of forming compounds is based upon this premise. Nature tends towards stability. So I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to write that because I think that's one of the things that I definitely want you to remember about all of this, this guiding principle. Nature tends towards stability. Now, some atoms are more stable when they have a surplus of electrons, and we'll find out why. Uh, when we do bonding theory in the third market period of this course. And some of them are more stable when they have a deficiency. But when there's a deficiency and there's a surplus, um, they attract each other. The positive attracts the negative and we get a compound from it. So the idea of oxidation states is that if an atom isn't stable, it's going to form a compound so that it can become more stable. Okay, when I say stable, that doesn't mean that it's unchangeable. We, with our big human brains, can always add heat energy or light um, in order to make things that are stable become unstable. And we'll get to that when we talk about thermodynamics later in the course. All right, so what is an oxidation number then? I'm gonna go back to that. Oxidation numbers track the movement of electrons when you're forming a compound, which means that one atom is going to pull electrons towards itself and the other atom is going to uh, lose electron charge density in the process. If an atom loses electron charge density, it creates a deficiency we, we call positively charged. And when an atom uh, receives more electron density, and we'll get into electron density when we do periodicity in the third market period as well. So when an atom takes on more electric charge, it becomes negatively charged, and we say it has a surplus of charge. And again, the positive attracts the negative, and, and we get a compound. And that's really all you have to know at this point. Now, why call them oxidation numbers instead of charge numbers? 
Well, there are two bonding types, main types. There's actually a lot of bonding types, but there's two main types that you learned about in middle school, one being an ionic compound, the other one being a covalent compound. And you remember covalent is where they say they shared electrons. Well, we're going to find out, yeah, they share electrons, but they don't share electrons equally. So one of them becomes positive and one of them becomes negative. And an ionic, you know that one atom gives away its electrons and becomes positive, and the other atom which takes the electrons becomes negative, and then the positive negative forms the bond. And, and what we're gonna find out is that, uh, yeah, that's kind of true, but it's not 100% true because uh, the nature of, of forming a bond is more complicated than that. But for now, we're, we're just gonna build off of your middle school knowledge, all right? So electrons are involved in bonding. Um, they're gonna move around during that bonding process. And we're going to track that movement in terms of what we call oxidation numbers. Now, when something forms a certain oxidation state or has a certain oxidation number, it is because it is more stable when it has that condition. Oxygen, for instance, loves to have a negative two charge. We'll find out why later in the course. Something like sodium prefers to have a positive one oxidation state. It's more stable. Why? We'll find out later in the course. Remember, can't teach you everything at once. All right, so we're going to take a look at how we assign oxidation numbers. And then we're going to take a look at putting together those oxidation numbers uh, to form compounds. So ultimately, what I want to be able to do with this at the end is create possible formulas for ionic compounds from the name of that compound. And then I want you to be also to be able to construct uh, formulas from oxidation numbers. So that's gonna be our two main tasks. All right, so let's go back here. A couple of rules. First of all, on the periodic table, there's something called main groups and there's something called transition groups. And we're going to talk about that. And some of the main groups have a set oxidation number. And you may have learned a little bit about that in middle school. If not, don't worry about it. I'm about to go over it. When you combine atoms to create a compound, their oxidation numbers should add up to be zero. Okay. In other words, you have to balance the charges. When we're dealing with the transition groups rather than the main groups, we have to provide a little bit more information. Uh, using Roman numerals, and I will explain how and why. And then lastly, when we have special groups of atoms, they sometimes have their own oxidation state as well, and we'll conclude with that. All right, so let's go to something more coherent. All right, first of all, main groups and transition groups. So if we look at our periodic table, the tall columns to the left and to the right um, these are going to be our main groups. So this is called, I don't, what? here's the number right here. This is the modern numbering. This 1A, 2A thing um, is still used, but it's, it's not how it's taught for the last 25 years. But anyway, uh, group 1, group 2, and then group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. These are called main groups. And then I'll use a different color here. Um, these at the bottom and the ones from group three over to group 12, these are called our transition groups. Okay. As it turns out, the main groups tend to have certain charges that we're gonna ask you to memorize. More memorization. So let's go to our blank periodic table. Everything that is in group one, these things always form a positive one oxidation state when they're bonding. Everything in group two forms a positive two. Now, everything in the transition, these have multiple oxidation states, so we're not going to worry about these for now. Group 13, ugh, this is where it gets a little tricky. Group 13 tends to be positive 3, but not always. And group 14 tends to be positive 4. But there's so many exceptions to group 14 being positive 4. For now, we are just going to ignore it, and we will come back later in the course. Most things in group 15 form negative 3. 
16, negative 2, 17, negative 1 state, and 18, a 0 oxidation state. So you're gonna be expected to memorize that, but it's pretty easy. You're gonna skip over the transition elements and you're gonna go up in number, and then you're going to go uh, down in number. And I'm gonna say you know, something right now. These are not algebraic numbers. When we talk about charge, you know, if I ask you the question, well, which of these two particles has more charge? Um, positive one ion or a negative three ion? Well, it turns out this has more charge. I know it's a lower number, negative three than positive one, but it has more charge because there are two types of charges, positive and negative. And what we're saying here is that something with a negative three has three of the negative charge, and where this positive one only has one of the positive charge. So they are equal and opposite of each other if that's possible. Think of it as, as male and female. If I said that, you know, we had a group of two females, call that positive two, and then we had a group of four males, and we called that negative four, the positive and negative just represents that the males and females are different from each other, but the group that has the most people would be the negative four. So on our periodic table, I would say it's easy to memorize. Group one, positive one. Group two, positive two. See, it's going up in number. Positive one, positive two. And then the 13, positive three. Skip 14. And then negative three, negative two, negative one. Now we're going down in charge, but on the negative side. So we have a positive side and a negative side. Now, this little line, I'm going to do it in red. This little line right here is called the break line. And along the break line, we get something called metalloids, which we're going to talk about later in the course. But for now, everything to the left and below that zigzag line, those are metals. Everything to the right and above it, those are non-metals. Okay, so now we're set. We have certain groups that we can memorize the charge. Now, we've got to be careful with this. We have to be flexible in our thoughts. Here's something I stole off the internet because that's what I do. I was like, okay, so how are they teaching this? Well, apparently this person is teaching positive one, positive two, positive three, positive four. But here's the truth of the matter is um, aluminum, oopsie poopsie, aluminum, yes, is always positive three oxidation state. However, boron's a mess. Gallium has two different states. Indium has two different states. Yes, positive three is one of those states for all of them. But they are so often not positive three than what they are positive three that I don't even consider it worth memorizing. So I would say, look, everything group one, positive one. Everything group two, positive two. Aluminum, we're going to focus on from group 13 with a positive three. Group 14, we said we're going to skip. Group 15, again, this negative three thing, but I can tell you antimony never forms negative three. And group 18, well, yeah, okay, we'll stick with negative two there. And group 19, we'll stick with negative one, although there are exceptions. Um, so really for group 13, we're gonna focus on just nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, the rules change slightly when we go from ionic to covalent. So I'm just gonna focus on ionic in this video, and then the next video we'll start talking about what the differences are. Okay, so assigning oxidation numbers. Main groups. Now we said compounds have to add up to be zero. So let's say we have, for instance, water. Now, water, according to IUPAC uh, denotations, would be called hydrogen one oxide. Nobody calls it hydrogen one oxide. Let's call it water. And so for water, we know that the formula is H2O. Now we look up the oxidation numbers. Hydrogen is in group one. It is almost always positive one. It can sometimes be negative one, but it's always positive, usually almost always positive one. And there are two hydrogen atoms. So the hydrogens are contributing a deficiency of positive two. Oxygen, we look up as in group 16, and the charge for that group, oxygen is stable when it's negative two. So these two charges balance each other. We want the charges to add up to be zero, so it makes sense that the formula for water is H2O. Another chemical you probably know. Sodium chloride, NaCl. Now, with sodium chloride, 
we look up the sodium. It's a group one metal, has a positive one charge. Chlorine is group 17 nonmetal. It has a negative charge. Those charges add up to be zero. Again, it makes sense that the formula is NaCl. One sodium has a deficiency. The one chlorine has a surplus. They are a match made in heaven for each other. Good for them. Okay, now what do they want you to do with this? For ionic compounds, there's only one combination you can get from main group elements. For ionic, we said that in middle school, an ionic is when you take a metal and you combine it with Oh, okay, we combine it with nonmetal. Okay. Now, the way these naming systems and formula systems usually work is they put the positive thing on the left of the formula. Notice in water and in sodium chloride, the positive was on the left. And the negative material is on the right. We call this a binary compound, something that has a positive thing and a negative thing. Great. And we said that those positives and negatives should add up to be zero. Now, it's the same for covalent. The positive is on the left, the negative is on the right. But the problem with covalent, I said I was going to save this, but I can't help myself save this for another video. When we're dealing with covalent main groups, main group elements coming together, um, you're dealing with two nonmetals. Nonmetals come together to form a covalent compound. All right, so suppose we have carbon dioxide. Okay, well, here's how you would figure it out. Most nonmetals have a negative charge. However, we can figure out the charge on the carbon. Well, Mr. Burnett, you just showed us in that chart it was positive 4. Yeah, it's going to be positive 4 on this one, but then I'm going to show you an example where it's not positive 4. All right, so oxygen's group 16. The charge of group 16 is always negative 2, and there's two oxygens, so we have a deficiency of negative 4. All right, so in order for this to add up to be 0, we do a little mental algebra, and we know that carbon has to be a positive 4 charge. In fact, the IUPAC, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, call this compound, not carbon dioxide, they call it carbon 4, they put a Roman numeral next to it, and then they say oxide, carbon four oxide. All right, so that chart said carbon's always positive four, and I said, be careful, it's not. What if you had carbon monoxide? Well, if oxygen is negative two, then carbon can't be positive four, because if carbon was positive four, they wouldn't add up to be zero, and we wouldn't have stability. Okay, so what is carbon then? Well, carbon's going to have to be in a different oxidation state. Just so happens that carbon is sometimes stable when it's positive too. So with a covalent material, what happens is the element on the left is what we call the electronegative element. We're going to come back to that term in the third marking period. And the element on the right, even though it's a nonmetal, has to become electropositive. Now, how does it become electropositive? Again, I can't teach you everything in one day, and I don't know everything anyway, but um, we'll get to that later in the course. But for now, you're gonna accept that if it's on the left, it's positive. When it's on the right, it's negative. So suppose we had something like this. Do an ionic compound, and I gave you the name, let's say we were doing um, magnesium bromide and they wanted you to come up with the chemical formula. Here's what you would do. First of all, you're gonna look up the symbols. If you don't know that magnesium is Mg, you look it up on the periodic table. If you don't know that bromine is Br, you look it up on the periodic table. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use the periodic table to get the symbol. Now, second thing, we need the oxidation number. All right, so we know the thing on the left has to be positive, the thing on the right has to be negative. So we look up magnesium, it's in group two. Magnesium always has a charge of positive two. We look up bromine, it's in group 17, always has a charge of negative one. All right, so then we have to say, well, is that balanced? 
And the answer is no. So to be stable, we're going to have to bring in a second bromine atom so that the whole thing adds up to be negative 2 from bromine. That'll balance it. So our formula is actually MgBr2. Now, some people teach what's called the crisscross method. And let's say we, in the crisscross method, let's say x is positive 3, and y, the thing on the left, is a negative 2 charge. Then they say, just take the positive 3 and move it down here, negative 2, and put it here, and you get x2, y3 for your formula. I, I don't like the crisscross method because it doesn't work with every single compound. I prefer that you understand the charges, how to look up the charges, and how to use them to construct the formula. So third thing we do is we're going to balance the charges. There you go, and that puts together our formula. Now I said that the positive thing is always on the left and the negative thing is always on the right. There is sometimes an exception um, when you're dealing with orgo. We said the most important element is carbon. So carbon will always be the first element in any organic compound regardless of the charge. So that's our exception. All right, so let's go back to our slideshow because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. I wanna make sure that I cover everything properly for you. All right, so we said main group elements have certain oxidation numbers that we are going to memorize. Great. We said that oxidation, well, I don't know if it's great. It's pretty good, I guess. Oxidation numbers always add up to be zero in a compound. Okay. Now we get to this transition elements. Well, transition elements actually have multiple ways in which they can be stable. And again, we'll talk about that later in the course, how they do it. But for now, we're going to accept that they have multiple oxidation numbers. And in order to let you know which transition element state they're talking about, uh, they're going to put that in Roman numerals. Okay, so before we do that, let's review Roman numerals because you were not raised in ancient Rome. Now, the Roman numerals always represent positive charge. So if they use a Roman numeral one, that means that the material has a charge of plus one. Roman numeral two is II, means positive two. Again, these are all positives. Roman numeral three, III. Roman numeral four, IV. Roman numeral five, now, I'm putting the little bars over it because that's generally what they do, but I, I'll tell you in the modern text, they, they really don't, so maybe I should stop doing that. Um, maybe it would be better if I just wrote it. I, mm, eraser. I, 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 sound like a pirate. I, V, V, positive 5, V, I, positive 6, and if you're insulted by this Roman numeral thing, okay, good, I know you're smart. Don't be offended. I just want to make sure you know it, because that would be a shame to get it wrong just because you didn't know Roman numerals. Anyway, so let's say that they gave you this on a test. Hey, what's the formula for this thing? Uh, let's do copper two oxide. So copper with a Roman numeral two oxide. All right, so we've been through this course. We know that this Roman numeral two means positive, and since it's Roman numeral two and not Roman numeral one, it's a positive 2. So we look up copper on the periodic table and we write Cu because it comes from the Latin term cupric. And we know that it's going to have a positive 2 charge. And for oxide, which is a main group, comes from oxygen, right? So oxygen becomes oxide in the naming system. So oxygen is normally negative 2. So we only need one copper atom to bounce out the charge on one oxygen atom. And copper two oxide is a black powder. It's pretty stable. It is poisonous though. Um, there's also a red powder from copper oxide called copper one oxide. It's very unstable because copper is more stable when it's positive two charge than it is when it's positive one charge. But we would approach this the same way. We'd say, all right, hey, Roman numeral, they're telling us the charge, thank you. Thank you for doing that. That makes our lives easier. And copper, we look up Cu with a positive one charge. Oxide means oxygen, group 16, negative two charge. So we need two of these coppers, copper particles to balance out the oxygen particle. So our formula is gonna be Cu2 and then O for oxygen. 
All right, so they give you the name, and you could come up with the formula using transition elements. So let's stop here for a second and give you two to try, one with main groups and one with um, transition elements. So let's do aluminum sulfide. That's one. And then let's try this. Um, let's do manganese because you know I love when people make a mistake on manganese. Uh, let's do manganese 6, and we'll do chloride. All right, so I'm going to pause here, and you can pause, work them out, and then come back. All right, I'm back. Here we go. Aluminum sulfide. So positives on the left, negatives on the right. So aluminum is Al. Uh, sulfur, sulfide, sulfur. So I look up sulfur. Aluminum's in group 13. So I know that that's a positive 3, where sulfur is in group 16. All group 16 materials are negative 2. Okay, so now we can do a little crisscross method here, or we can reason this out. I'd rather you reason it out. We need two aluminum particles to have the same charge as three sulfur particles. This will give me positive 6 on the aluminum total. And this will give me negative 6 on the sulfur. So my formula is going to be 2 aluminums, 3 sulfurs. So Al2S3, happy, happy compound. Now, manganese 6 chloride. Again, transition element. Thank you for telling us the charge. You made it easy. It's positive 6 on the manganese. I look Mn for manganese, not Mg, because I'm not a noob. And I put positive 6 next to the manganese. Chlorine, I look up, group 17. Everything in group 17 I memorized is negative 1. So how many chlorines do I need? Well, I'm going to have to multiply this by 6, right? Sort of like dealing with fractions, least common denominators. All right. <clears throat> so one manganese particle for six chlorines, and our formula is MnCl6. polyatomic groups okay there are certain groups of atoms that are found so commonly in compounds and we will talk about these groups again later in the course when we talk about bonding theory how they form and how they hypoconjugate and all that kind of stuff so polyatomic groups you will not find them on the periodic table they are special groups and they have special group names now there are over a hundred of these and there's a very easy way to learn all of them if by the time you get to advanced chemistry, if you kind of follow my rules for high school chemistry. All right, I'm going to ask you to memorize eight of them. They are the eight most common ones that are used in the lab. So we're going to start with something called ammonium. Now, I have this chart in your notes, by the way if you don't want to copy all this stuff, if you're following the notes in the slideshow. And ammonium has a formula of NH4 with a positive. And what that means is that the positive is not on the nitrogen. The positive charge is not on the four hydrogens. What we're saying is that when they combine, they share a positive one charge. And we'll talk about how that's possible when we get to bonding theory. Another group I want you to use is something called acetate. And I'm going to do it the organic chemistry way. CH3, COO, with a negative charge. Remember, carbon comes first in organic compounds, and this is organic. Some textbooks, you'll see it written as C2H3O2, but that's people who hate acetate. I prefer CH3COO-. And third one, chlorate. Now, the ones with ATE, except for acetate. Acetate comes from a Latin word, acete meaning two car meaning actually it winds up meaning two carbons i don't think it literally means two carbons anyway the ones that end in ate have oxygen in them usually all right so chlorate would be a comp would be a group formed from chlorine that's where the chlor comes from and oxygen so we have clo3 and then that group shares a negative one charge and then we have nitrate Phosphate, carbonate, two 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What am I missing? Nitrate, phosphate, carbonate, sulfate. And again, that ATE means it's got oxygen in there. So you nitrate would have nitrogen and oxygen. Now I mentioned this because if you wind up looking at the practice tests, you will be given a group of polyatomic formulas. <clears throat> in other words, I'll have NO3 on the test uh, listed as a given, NH4 plus on the test, but I won't have the names. So I'm gonna actually, you're not really memorizing this. I'm asking you to meet me halfway. I'm gonna give you the formulas, a list of polyatomic ion formulas. You just have to recognize the name. So when you recognize nitrogen with oxygen, you know that's nitrate. If you see a group with phosphorus and oxygen, regardless of the charge, regardless of the number of oxygens, you know that's phosphate. And when you see carbon with oxygen, that's carbonate. And sulfur with oxygen, oopsie poopsie, sulfate. Okay. And that's going to change when we get to the fourth marking period because if you know these, it's going to be really easy to know the formulas for the rest of them as well. So we're just gonna start with these uh, right now seven. The eighth one is something called hydroxide. And hydroxide, hydrogen, oxide. So oxygen and hydrogen, but they write the oxygen first. So it's OH with negative one charge. Okay, why do you care? Well, suppose they give you this on a test and they say, all right, we want the formula for our, yeah, we want the formula for sodium sulfate. Okay, we can do that. Uh, we look up on the periodic table the symbol for sodium, Na, and we know that it's the positive thing. So what's the charge on sodium? Well, it's in group one, so what's the charge? Okay, you already memorized, I'm pretending you already memorized that sodium has positive one charge because it's in group one. Everything in group one has a positive one charge. Now, sulfate, you got to recognize that ATE means a special group. So, all right, I'll use the list on the test, see which special group has sulfur and oxygen, and it's SO4 2 minus. So that gives you your formula. Now, charge. There's not enough charge from the sodium, so we're going to multiply the sodium by two. That means we're going to use two particles of sodium for every one group of sulfate. So we get a formula of Na2, two sodiums, sulfate, SO4. Be careful with my fours. I don't know why I do this. Sometimes I write four like that, and sometimes I write a four like that. And I've tried to be consistent with it, and I never am. I keep going back and forth on it for some reason. I, I don't know why. I guess lack of discipline on my part. All right, what if we had this one then? Let's do um, ammonium oxide. Okay, we can do that. Uh, if ammonium oxide, well, ammonium is not on the periodic table. It's one of the eight special groups I asked you to memorize. And it is, let's use a different color here, NH4, and they share a positive one charge. Oxygen, oxide, it's from oxygen, is in group 16, negative two charge. So we need two ammoniums to balance out the charge on the oxygen, because the ammoniums are gonna give us a total of positive two. The oxygens are gonna give us negative two. Okay, so two ammonium groups. Here's where your parentheses come in. We like to keep the groups together. So if you have more than one of a polyatomic group, notice I didn't do it with sulfate, but if you have more than one of a group, you put parentheses around it and you write as a subscript how many of that group you use. So ammonium, parentheses, two, and then O for oxide. So there's our answer. All right, last, uh, I'll let recitation uh, take care of the rest. Here's the last thing I want you to be able to do because this video is starting to run long. If they give you two elements and say, look, we want an ionic compound from it, and they ask, what is the only compound you can get from strontium? And let's combine that with phosphorus. All right, so strontium's on the left side of the periodic table, and it was the first one named, 
So we know that the strontium has to be the positive thingy, and phosphorus has to be the negative thingy. And so now we can say, all right, is strontium transition or regular main group? It's main group. It's in group two. So we know something about strontium. We look it up on the periodic table. We got its symbol. And we also know that everything in group two has a positive two charge. With phosphorus, well, that's in group 15. So when phosphorus is ionic, everything in group 15 is going to have our negative three charge. So now we just have to get this to balance. And in order to get this to balance, we're going to multiply the strontium particles by three. And we're going to multiply the phosphorus particles by two. This way we get a charge of six for both materials. And so our formula is SR3P2. All right, let me just go back, check, make sure I covered everything that we were supposed to cover. I'm trying to learn to let go, people. I know you're doing a recitation, so I got to learn not to go over every single thing in these little video lessons. All right, we talked about oxidation numbers and stability and why something, well, we didn't explain why some things are more stable, but we're going to accept that some particles are more stable when they have a positive or negative charge. Certain, uh, in our main group elements, they have certain set charges that they form. And when we form metals to non-metals, or non-metals to non-metals, the oxidation numbers have to add up to be zero. With a transition element, it's a little bit trickier because transition elements have multiple charges that make them stable. So they will tell us the charge using Roman numerals. Oh, by the way, here's a list from your textbook of all these different polyatomic ions. Like I said, you only have to know the eight that I went over. So again, a polyatomic group is a special group commonly found. We're going to keep it together as a group. And whatever the charge is on that group, it shares that charge. And there were eight of them that I'm asking you to memorize. And that's the list of eight. And we said we should be able to create formulas from the names, which we did. And we should be able to uh, construct formulas if they just give us the two elements using the oxidation numbers. So pretty good session here. I'm going to end it. Thank you very much, and I'll catch you on the next video.